Okay, but, um, man. Man, that, that, I was in a bit of a panic there when the webcam died. And to run next door, grab a, uh, grab a second one. Don't know what's up with that. Okay. Let's do it. Enough yapping. Time to start reading. Let's do it. Backing up a page. Here we go. For a moment, Bulan, who's, um, that, that's number 13, remember, he, he was given that name, Bulan. Uh, for a moment, Bulan stood watching the retreating savages, a smile upon his lips. And then, as the sudden equatorial dawn burst forth, he turned to face the girl. As Virginia Maxson saw the fine features of the giant, where she had expected to find the grotesque and hideous lineaments of a monster, she gave a quick little cry of pleasure and relief. Oh, thank God, she cried fervently. Thank God that you're a man. I thought that I was in the clutches of the hideous and soulless monster number 13. The smile upon the young man's face died. An expression of pain and hopelessness and sorrow swept across his features. The girl saw the change and wondered, but how could she guess the grievous wound her words had inflicted? That's right. She's, uh, she has not made the connection. Still, still has not made the connection between this mysterious, young, good-looking man and... Uh, her father's hopes to create the perfect man for her. All right. A.K.A. number 13. All right. Would you have made the connection by now? Possibly. Possibly. There we go. Chapter 15. Too late. For a moment, the two stood in silence. Bulan, tortured by thoughts of the bitter humiliation that he must suffer when the girl should learn his identity. Virginia wondering at the sad lines that had come into the young man's face and at his silence. It was the girl who spoke first. Who are you, she asked, to whom I owe my safety? The man hesitated. To speak aught than the truth had never occurred to him during his brief existence. He scarcely knew how to lie. To him a question demanded but one manner of reply. The facts. But never before had he had to face a question where so much depended upon his answer. He tried to form the bitter, galling words. But a vision of that lovely face, suddenly transformed with horror and disgust, throttled the name in his throat. I am Bulan, he said at last quietly. Bulan, repeated the girl. Bulan. Why, that is a native name. You are either an Englishman or an American. What is your true name? My name is Bulan, he insisted doggedly. Virginia Maxson thought that he must have some good reason of his own for wishing to conceal his identity. At first she wondered if he could be a fugitive from justice, the perpetrator of some horrid crime who dared not divulge his true name, even in the remote fastness of a Bornean wilderness. But a glance at his frank and noble countenance drove every vestige of the traitorous thought from her mind. Her woman's intuition was sufficient guarantee of the nobility of his character. Then let me thank you, Mr. Bulan, she said, for the service that you have rendered a strange and helpless woman. He smiled. Just Bulan, he said. There is no need for Miss or Mr. in the savage jungle, Virginia. The girl flushed at the sudden and unexpected use of her given name and was surprised that she was not offended. How do you know my name? she asked. Bulan saw that he would get into deep water if he attempted to explain too much, and, as is ever the way, discovered that one deception had led him into another, so he determined to forestall future embarrassing queries by concocting a story immediately to explain his presence and his knowledge. I lived upon the island near your father's camp, he said. I knew you all by sight. 
How long have you lived there? asked the girl. We thought the island uninhabited. All my life, replied Bulan truthfully. It is strange, she mused. I cannot understand it, but the monsters, how is it that they followed you and obeyed your... This, he said. He used that upon them, cried the girl in horror. It was the only way, said Bulan. They were almost brainless. They could understand nothing else, for they could not reason. Uh oh, what's Rose Akin at? Ak, ak, ak. Um, bleep, 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 bleep. um uh, they, they could not reason again. Okay. Virginia shuddered. Uh, where are they now, the balance of them? she asked. They are dead, poor things, he replied sadly. Poor, hideous, unloved, unloving monsters. They gave up their lives for the daughter of the man who made them the awful, repulsive creatures that they were. What do you mean? cried the girl. I mean that all have been killed searching for you and battling with your enemies. They were soulless creatures, but they loved the mean lives they gave up so bravely for you whose father was the author of their misery. You owe a great deal to them, Virginia. Oh, poor things, murmured the girl, but yet they are better off, for without brains or souls there could be no happiness in life for them. My father did a hideous wrong, but it was an unintentional wrong. His mind was crazed with dwelling upon the wonderful discovery he had made, and if he wronged them, he contemplated a still more terrible wrong to be inflicted upon me, his daughter. I do not understand, said Bulan. It was his intention to give me in marriage to one of his soulless monsters, to the one he called Number Thirteen. Oh, it is terrible even to think of the hideousness of it. But now they're all dead. He cannot do it, even though his poor mind, which seems well again, should suffer a relapse. Why do you loathe them so? asked Bulan. Is it because they are hideous, or because they are soulless? Either fact were enough to make them repulsive, replied the girl but it is the fact that they were without souls that made them totally impossible. One easily overlooks physical deformity, but the moral depravity that must be inherent in a creature without a soul must forever cut him off from intercourse with human beings. And you think that regardless of their physical appearance, the fact that they were without souls would have been apparent? asked Bulan. Oh, I'm sure of it, cried Virginia. I would know the moment I set my eyes upon a creature without a soul. With all the sorrow that was his, Bulan could scarce repress a smile, for it was quite evident, either, that it was impossible to perceive a soul, or else that he possessed one. Just how do you distinguish the possessor of a soul? he asked. The girl cast a quick glance up at him. Oh, you're making fun of me, she said. Not at all, he replied. I am just curious as to how souls make themselves apparent. I have seen men kill one another as beasts kill. I have seen one who was cruel to those within his power, yet they were all men with souls. I have seen eleven soulless monsters die to save the daughter of a man whom they believed had wronged them terribly, a man with a soul. How then am I to know what attributes denote the possession of the immortal spark? How am I to know whether or not I possess a soul? Virginia smiled. You are courageous and honorable and chivalrous. Those are enough to warrant the belief that you have a soul. 
were it not apparent from your countenance that you are of the higher type of mankind, she said. I hope that you will never change your opinion of me, Virginia, said the man. But he knew that there lay before her a severe shock, and before him a great sorrow, when they should come to where her father was, and the girl should learn the truth concerning him. That he did not himself tell her may be forgiven him, for he had only a life of misery to look forward to, after she should know that he, too, was equally a soulless monster with the twelve that had preceded him to a merciful death. He would have envied them but for the anticipation of the time that he might be alone with her before she learned the truth. As he pondered the future, there came to him the thought that they should never find Professor Maxon or Von Horn, Oh, that should they never find Professor Maxon or Von Horn, the girl need never know but that he was a human being. He need, he need not lose her then, but always be near her. The idea grew, and with it the mighty temptation to lead Virginia Maxon far into the jungle and keep her forever from the sight of men. And why not? Had he not saved her where others had failed? Was she not, by all that was just and fair, his? Did he owe any loyalty to either her father or von Horn? Already he had saved Professor Maxon's life, so the obligation, if there was any, lay all against the older man, and three times he had saved Virginia. He would be very kind and good to her. She should be much happier and a thousand times safer than with those others who were so poorly equipped to protect her. Ah! And he, as he stood silently gazing out across the jungle beneath them, toward the new sun, the girl watched him in a spell of admiration of his strong and noble face and his perfect physique. What would have been her emotions had she guessed what thoughts were his? It was she who broke the silence. Can you find the way to the long house where my father is? she asked. Bulan, startled at the question, looked up from his reverie. The thing must be faced, then, sooner than he thought. How was he to tell her of his intention? It occurred to him to sound her first. Possibly she would make no objection to the plan. You are anxious to return, he asked. Why, yes, of course I am, she replied. My father will be half mad with apprehension until he knows I am safe. What a strange question indeed. Still, however, she did not doubt the motives of her companion. Suppose we should be unable to find our way to the longhouse, he continued. Oh, don't say such a thing, cried the girl. It would be terrible. I should die of misery and fright and loneliness in this awful jungle. Surely you can find your way to the river. It was but a short march through the jungle from where we landed to the spot at which you took me away from that fearful Malay. The girl's words cast a cloud over Bulan's hopes. The future looked less roseate with the knowledge that she would be unhappy in the life that he had been mapping for them. He was silent, thinking. In his breast, a rioting of conflicting emotions were waging the first great battle which was to point the trend of the man's character. Would the selfish and the base prevail, or would the noble? With the thought of losing her, his desire for her companionship became almost a mania. To return her to her father and von Horn would be to lose her. Of that there could be no doubt, for they would not leave her long in ignorance of his origin. Then, in addition to being deprived of her forever, he must suffer the galling mortification of her scorn. It was a great deal to ask of a fledgling morality that there was yet scarcely... Oh, no, let's try that again. 
It was a great deal to ask of a fledgling morality that was yet scarcely cognizant of its untried wings. But even as the man wavered between right and wrong, there crept into his mind the one great and burning question of his life. Had he a soul? And he knew that upon his decision of the fate of Virginia Maxon rested to some extent the true answer to that question. For unconsciously he had worked out his own crude soul hypothesis, which imparted to this invisible entity the power to direct his actions only for good. Therefore he reasoned that wickedness presupposed a small and worthless soul, or the entire lack of one. That she would hate a soulless creature, he accepted. What was that? That she would hate a soulless creature, he accepted as a foregone conclusion. He desired her respect, and that fact helped him to his final decision, but the thing that decided him was born of the truly chivalrous nature he possessed. He wanted Virginia Maxon to be happy. It mattered not at what cost to him. The girl had been watching him closely as he stood silently, thinking after her last words. She did not know the struggle that the calm face hid, yet she felt that the dragging moments were big with the question of her fate. Well, she said at last, We must eat first, he replied in a matter-of-fact tone, and not at all as though he was about to renounce his life's happiness. And then we shall set out in search of your father. I shall take you to him, Virginia, if man can find him. I knew that you could, she said simply, but how my father and I can ever repay you I do not know. Do you? Yes, said Bulan, and there was a sudden rush of fire to his eyes that kept Virginia Maxon from urging a detailed explanation of just how she might repay him. In truth, she did not know whether to be angry or frightened or glad of the truth that she read there, or mortified that it had awakened in her a realization that possibly an analysis of her own interest in this young stranger might reveal more than she had imagined. The constraint that suddenly fell upon them was relieved when Bulan motioned her to follow him back down the trail into the gorge in search of food. There they sat together upon a fallen tree beside a tiny rivulet, eating the fruit that the man gathered. Often their eyes met as they talked, but always the girls fell before the open worship of the man's. Many were the men who had looked in admiration at Virginia Maxon in the past, but never, she felt, with eyes so clean and brave and honest. There was no guile or evil in them, and because of it she wondered all the more that she could not face them. What a wonderful soul those eyes portray, she thought, and how perfectly they assure the safety of my life and honor while their owner is near me. And the man thought, Would that I owned a soul, that I might aspire to live always near her, always to protect her. When they had eaten, the two set out once more in search of the river, and the confidence that is born of ignorance was theirs, so that beyond each succeeding tangled barrier of vines and creepers they looked to see the swirling stream that would lead them to the girl's father. On and on they trudged, the man often carrying the girl across the rougher obstacles and through the little streams that crossed their path, until at last came noon, and yet no sign of the river they sought. The combined jungle craft of the two had been insufficient either to trace the ways that they had come or point the general direction of the river. As the afternoon drew to a close, Virginia Maxon commenced to lose heart, she was confident that they were lost. Bulan made no pretense of knowing the way, the most that he would say being that eventually they must come to the river. 
As a matter of fact, had it not been for the girl's evident concern, he would have been glad to know that they were irretrievably lost. But for her sake, his efforts to find the river were conscientious. When at last night closed down upon them, the girl was, at heart, terror-stricken, but she hid her true state from the man because she knew that their plight was no fault of his. The strange and uncanny noises of the jungle night filled her with the most dreadful forebodings, and when a cold, drizzling rain set in upon them, her cup of misery was full. Bulan rigged a rude shelter for her, making her lie down beneath it, and then he removed his Dayak war coat and threw it over her. But it was hours before her exhausted body overpowered her nervous fright and won a fitful and restless slumber. Several times Virginia became obsessed with the idea that Bulan had left her alone there in the jungle. But when she called his name, he answered from close beside her shelter. She thought that he had reared another for himself nearby, but even the thought that he might sleep filled her with dread. Yet she would not call to him again, since she knew that he needed his rest even more than she. And all the night, Bulan stood close beside the woman he had learned to love stood almost naked in the chill night air and the cold rain, lest some savage man or beast creep out of the darkness after her while he slept. The next day, with its night, and the next, and the next, were but repetitions of the first. It had become an agony of suffering for the man to fight off sleep longer. The girl read part of the truth in his heavy eyes and worn face and tried to force him to take needed rest, but she did not guess that he had not slept for four days and four nights. At last, abused nature succumbed to the terrific strain that had been put upon her, and the giant constitution of the man went down before the cold and the wet, weakened and impoverished by loss of sleep and insufficient food for through the last two days he had been able to find but little, and that little he had given to the girl, telling her that he had eaten his fill while he gathered hers. It was on the fifth morning when Virginia awoke that she found Bulan rolling and tossing upon the wet ground before her shelter, delirious with fever. At the sight of the mighty figure reduced to pitiable inefficiency and weakness, despite the knowledge that her protector could no longer protect, the fear of the jungle faded from the heart of the young girl. She was no more a weak and trembling daughter of an effete civilization. Instead, she was a lioness, watching over and protecting her sick mate. The analogy did not occur to her, but something else did as she saw the flushed face and fever-racked body of the man whose appeal to her she would have thought purely physical had she given the subject any analytic consideration. And as a realization of his utter helplessness came to her, she bent over him and kissed first his forehead and then his lips. "'What a noble and unselfish love yours has been,' she murmured. "'You have even tried to hide it, that my position might be the easier to bear, "'and now that it may be too late, I learn that I love you, that I've always loved you. "'Oh, Bulan, my Bulan, what a cruel fate that has permitted us to find one another, "'only to die together.' "'Man, oh, man!' Boy, oh boy, lost in the jungle. Yeah, yeah, we're a boy, oh boy. And uh, and then that's the end. Uh, well, well, no, it's not. We got, we got two chapters to go. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe they're not gonna die in the jungle. I don't, it's a possibility. Edgar Rice Burroughs, he he put that um. He, 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 he put that possibility out there. This could be the end. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Good morning, BW. Good morning. How you doing? All righty. Jane was happy. Yeah, well, we, um, well, hang on. Jane. No, at the end of the first Tarzan book, um, 
uh, yeah, yeah, she, uh, uh, yeah, if she and Tarzan don't get together. Yeah. Boy, they had a, they had a very tumultuous uh, kind of thing going on. So, you think somebody's going to stumble upon them soon? Maybe. Maybe. Who knows? It's, 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 it's been... Everything seems to have been happening within a few, you know, a couple of miles of each other, even though everyone seems to be, like, so totally separated. Don't know. Don't know. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Here we go. Chapter 16. Okay. Two chapters to go. Will they live? And no, I, I, my money says no, it's all over. Chapter 16. Sing speaks. Finally. Finally, the the, the uh, <laughs> Sing Lee, who's overheard every sinister like plot and skullduggery, and uh, and, and's never said a word, never said a word to any. And he never went to uh, Professor Maxon and, and you know just saying, oh, by the way, the the chief of your crew there has totally made a deal with the pirates to uh, sell you all for uh, treasure. Uh, I mean, he could have done that a long time. And there's so many other things he's overheard. It's crazy. All right. Sing speaks. For a week, Professor Maxon with Von Horn and Sing sought for Virginia. They could get no help from the natives of the Longhouse, who feared the vengeance of Muda Safia should he learn that they had aided the white men upon his trail. And always, as the three hunted through the jungle and up and down the river, there lurked ever near a handful of the men of the tribe, of the two whom von, Hern, von Horn had murdered, waiting for the chance that would give them revenge and the heads of the three they followed. They feared the guns of the white men too much to venture an open attack, and at night the quarry never abated their watchfulness. So that days dragged on, and still the three continued their hopeless quest, unconscious of the relentless foe that dogged their footsteps. Von Horn was always searching for an opportunity to enlist the aid of the friendly natives in an effort to regain the chest, but so far he had found none who would agree to accompany him, even in consideration of a large share of the booty. It was the treasure alone which kept him to the search for Virginia Maxon, and he made it a point to direct the hunt always in the vicinity of the spot where it was buried, for a great fear consumed him that Nanaka might return and claim it before he had a chance to make away with it. Ah, yes, this mysterious box. I'm still hoping that it's, that it's going to contain no treasure, but something valuable to the professor. Uh, th th that's what I suspect. Three times during the week they returned and slept at the long house, hoping each time to learn that the natives had received some news of her they sought, through the wonderful channels of communication that seemed always open across the trackless jungle and up and down the savage, lonely rivers. For two days, Bulan lay raving in the delirium of fever, while the delicate girl, unused to hardship and exposure, watched over him and nursed him with the loving tenderness and care of a young mother with her firstborn. For the most part, the young giant's ravings were inarticulate, but now and then Virginia heard her name linked with words of reverence and worship. The man fought again, the man fought again the recent battles he had passed through, and again suffered the long night watches beside the sleeping girl who filled his heart. Then it was that she learned the truth of his self-sacrificing devotion. The thing that puzzled her most was the repetition of a number and a name which ran through all his delirium. 999 Priscilla she could make neither head nor tail of it, nor was there another word to give a clue to its meaning, so at last from constant repetition it became a commonplace, and she gave it no further thought. Okay, here's one of those things, once again, Edgar Rice Burroughs, is, like, there's been no foreshadowing of this, or no previous mention, I'm just out of the blue, 99, 999 Priscilla. 
Yeah, it's just because uh, because he's gonna need that really, really, really soon. He's, he's just put it in there. Okay, all right. The girl had given up hope that Bulan ever could recover. So weak and emaciated had he become, and when the fever finally left him, quite suddenly, she was positive that it was the beginning of the end. It was on the morning of the seventh day since they had commenced their wandering in search of the longhouse that, as she sat watching him, she saw his eyes resting upon her face with a look of recognition. Gently she took his hand, and at the act he smiled at her very weakly. "'You are better, Bulan,' she said. "'You have been very sick, but now you shall be well again.' She did not believe her own words, yet the mere saying of them gave her renewed hope. "'Yes,' replied the man, "'I shall soon be well again. How long have I been like this?' For two days, she replied. And you have watched over me, alone, in the jungle, for two days, he asked incredulously. Had it been for life, she said in a low voice, it would scarce have repaid the debt I owe you. For a long time he lay, looking up into her eyes, longingly, wistfully. My wish that it had been for life he said. At first she did not quite realize what he meant, but presently the tired and hopeless expression of his eyes brought to her a sudden knowledge of his meaning. Oh, Bulan, she cried, you must not say that. Why should you wish to die? Because I love you, Virginia, he replied, and because when you know what I am, you will hate and loathe me. And she still doesn't get it, still doesn't get it. On the girl's lips was an avowal of her own love, but as she bent closer to whisper the words in his ear, there came the sound of men crashing through the jungle, and as she turned to face the peril that she thought approaching, Von Horn sprang into view, while directly behind him came her father and Sing Lee. Bulan saw them at the same instant, and as Virginia ran forward to greet her father, he staggered weakly to his feet. Von Horn was the first to see the young giant, and with an oath sprang toward him, drawing his revolver as he came. Yeah, exactly, right on time, right on time. Um... Uh, Von Horn was the first to see the young giant, and with an oath sprang toward him, drawing his revolver as he came. "'You beast!' he cried. "'We have caught you at last!' At the words, Virginia turned back toward Bulan with a little scream of warning and of horror. Professor Maxon was behind her. "'Shoot the monster, Von Horn,' he ordered. "'Do not let him escape!' Bulan drew himself to his full height, and though he wavered from weakness, yet he towered mighty and magnificent above the evil-faced man who menaced him. Shoot, he said calmly. Death cannot come too soon now. At the same instant, Von Horn pulled the trigger. The giant's head fell back. He staggered, whirled about, and crumpled to the earth just as Virginia Maxon's arms closed about him. Von Horn rushed close, and pushing the girl aside, pressed the muzzle of his gun to Bulan's temple. But an avalanche of wrinkled yellow skin was upon him before he could pull the trigger a second time, and Sing Li had hurled him back a dozen feet and snatched his weapon. Sing Li finally does something. Moaning and sobbing, Virginia threw herself upon the body of the man she loved, while Professor Maxon hurried to her side to drag her away from the soulless thing for whom he had once intended her. Like a tigress, the girl turned upon the two white men. "'You are murderers!' she cried. "'Cowardly murderers! Weak and exhausted by fever, he could not combat you. And so you have robbed the world of one of the noblest men that God ever created.' Mm, "'Hush!' cried Professor Maxon. "'Hush, child, you do not know what you say. The thing was a monster, a soulless monster.' At the words, the girl looked up quickly at her father, 
a faint realization of his meaning striking her like a blow in the face. Oh, what do you mean? she whispered. Who was he? It was von Horn who answered. No god created that, he said with a contemptuous glance at the still body of the man at their feet. He was one of your creatures. He was one of the creatures of your father's mad experiments, the soulless thing for whose arms his insane obsession doomed you. The thing at your feet, Virginia, was number thirteen. With a piteous little moan, the girl turned back toward the body of the young giant. A faltering step she took toward it, and then to the horror of her father, she sank upon her knees beside it, and lifting the man's head in her arms, covered the face with kisses. Virginia, cried the professor, are you mad, child? I am not mad, she moaned, not yet. I love him, man or monster, it would have been all the same to me, for I loved him. Her father turned away, burying his face in his hands. God, he muttered, what an awful punishment you have visited upon me for the sin of the thing I did. The silence which followed was broken by Singh, who had kneeled opposite Virginia, upon the other side of Bulan, where he was feeling the giant's wrists and pressing his ear close above his heart. "'Don't cry, Linny,' said the kindly old uh, Sing Lee. "'He's not dead.' Then as he poured a pinch of brownish powder into the man's... <laughs> He poured a pinch of brownish powder into the man's mouth from a tiny sack he had brought forth from the depths of one of his sleeves. He's no monster either, Linny. He's a white man. Also, all the same, Malaxon. The same as Maxon. Sing knew. The girl looked up at him in gratitude. He's not dead, Singly. He'll live, she cried. I don't care about anything else, Sing Lee. If you will only make him live. He'll live. Got a little flesh wound, that's all. Oh, what do you mean by saying he's not a monster? demanded Von Horn. You wait, you damn fool, cried Sing Lee. I tell a lot more than I, I tell a lot more that I know. You wait till I fix him, and then by God I'll fix you. Von Horn took a menacing step toward the toward Sing Lee, his face black with wrath, but Professor Maxon interposed. This has gone quite far enough, Dr. Von Horn, he said. It may be that we acted hastily. I, I do not know, of course, what Sing Lee means, but I intend to find out. He's been very faithful to us and deserves every consideration. Von Horn stepped back, still scowling. Sing Lee poured a little water between Bulan's lips, and then asked Professor Maxon for his brandy flask. It's all about the brandy flask. Oh, emergency rooms across the world would love to have some of the gunshot cure powder sing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, start, I, I just couldn't help but start laughing when I was reading that. It's just like, oh, well, of course he's got this stuff on him. Of course he's got it on him. And, and and now we got we got the everyone's running around in the jungle with a brandy flask on them. Zing Li poured a little water between Bulan's lips and then asked Professor Maxon for his brandy flask. With the first few drops of the fiery liquid, the giant's eyelids moved, and a moment later he raised them and looked about him. The first face he saw was Virginia's. It was full of love and compassion. They have not told you yet, he asked. Yes, she replied. They have told me, but it makes no difference. You've given me the right to say it, Bulan, and I do say it now, again, before them all. I love you, and that is all that there is, and that is all there is, and that is all there is that makes any difference. A look of happiness lighted his face momentarily, only to fade as quickly as it had come. No, Virginia, he said sadly. It would not be right. It would be wicked. I am not a human being. I am only a soulless monster. You cannot mate with such as I. 
you must go away with your father. Soon you will forget me. Never, Bulan, cried the girl determinedly. The man was about to attempt to dissuade her when Sing Li interrupted. Oh, you keep still, Bulan, he said. You wait till Sing Li tells you. It tells, tells all, I think. I'm trying to translate this best I can. You are no, you are no monster. Malax, Maxon, he make, he, he, he did not make you. Sing Li found you in a low boat just outside the cove, you dummy. You know nothing. No, no, no name. Don't know where he comes from. Doesn't talk. What? Sing, he hears Maxon tell Horn about number 13, how he makes him for Linny, makes Linny marry, marry him. Good Lord. Sing, Sing Lee knows what kind of freaks Maxon makes. Linny always good to old Sing Lee. Sing Lee, he has been peeking through a crack in the wall, sees big vat where thirteen is growing. Sing Li takes you to Sing's, this is so bizarre, takes you to Sing's shack that night, hides you till everybody is asleep. Then he sneaks you into the workshop, kicks over vat, leaves you next morning, Maxon makes big hullabaloo, dances up and down. Whoop, he's not so okay, boy. Whoop. Thirteen clone come too soon, but all right. Him fine, perfect man. Whoop. Anyway, you are better for Linny than one of Maxon's freaks, he concluded, turning toward Bulan. Oh, he's been... Uh, man! Okay, all righty. This is just crazy, crazy uh, exposition and... Um, And revel the things that Sing Lee has seen that nobody knows. Okay, so just out of the blue, out of the blue, suddenly it's revealed. I'm just going to explain this because that that was that was a, a jumble of mush we had to to go through there. That pigeon English is boy bad. Um, so number thirteen is not really number thirteen. Sing Lee found a fully grown man in a boat in the cove of the island, who had no recollection of his memory or where he came from or who he is. So, so Sing Lee knows that uh, the professor is going to marry off one of the, in bunny quotes, freaks that he's growing in the, in the vats, Go, goes and knocks over the vat, places this fully grown man that he found with amnesia, I guess, and <laughs> next to the vat, and everyone's just like, oh, that must be the fully grown up. This is, oh, my Lord. Oh, man. Is he lying about it? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that that's another possibility, too. But uh, but uh, but we've just had that weird bit, uh, like, uh, come, uh, like nine nine 99.9 .9 Priscilla. That was just um, just that was like two pages back, and that's going to tie into it somehow. If for this particular, I'm positive it's going to tie into this bit here. Man, you are lying, you yellow devil! Cried Von Horn. <laughs> Sing Lee turned his shrewd, shrewd eyes malevolently upon the doctor. Singly lies, he hissed. Maybe Singly lies when he asks what you for what you get bloodlean who's bloodlean uh, oh yeah boodoo dream boodoo dream for, uh, what do we what were you gonna get for boo boo dream stealing the treasure? But the Muda Safia he came and spoiled it all while you got Linny to the ship. Sing knows. Then you told Maxon thirteen stole Linny. You then lied, and you knew you lied. You lie again when thirteen saved Linny from the orangutan. You say you saved Linny. 
Then you made bad, uh, bad, bad talky, good Lord, with, with the Muda Safir at the longhouse. Sing, I heard you all the time. You try to get treasure away from the Dyaks for yourself, then... Uh, stop, roared Von Horn. Stop, you lying yellow sneak, before I put a bullet in you. Uh, both of you, stop now, said Professor Maxon authorit authoritatively. There have been charges made here that cannot go unnoticed. Can you prove these things, Singley? He asked, turning to Sing. I prove much by Voodoo Dreams, Las Laska. Oh, that's right. Yeah, his his um his uh, uh, cr uh crew member. Voodoo Dream told him all about who's horny about about uh, Horn von Horn. I prove some more by. I pr I I I can prove more at the uh, with the, the Dyak chief at the Longhouse. He knows lots. Muda Safir tell will will tell him it's all true, Maxon. And is it true about this man? The thing that you have told us is true. He's not one of those creatures in the laboratory. No, Maxon, you did not make a fine young man like Blulan. You know that, Maxon. You make one, two, three, all up to twelve, all freaks. You ought to know, Maxon, that you cannot make Blulan. Bulan. During these revelations, Bulan had sat with his eyes fixed upon Sing Lee. There was a puzzled expression upon his wan, blood-streaked face. It was as though he were trying to wrest from the inner temple of his consciousness a vague and tantalizing memory that eluded him each time that he had felt it within his grasp, the key to the strange riddle that hid his origin. The girl kneeled close beside him, one small hand in his. Hope and happiness had supplanted the sorrow in her face. She tore the hem from her skirt to bandage the bloody furrow that creased the man's temple. Professor Maxon stood silently by, watching the loving tenderness that marked each deft little movement of her strong brown hands. The revelations of the past few minutes had shocked the old man into stupefied silence. It was difficult— almost impossible for him to believe that Tsing Li had spoken the truth and that this man was not one of the creatures of his own creation. Yet from the bottom of his heart he prayed that it might prove the truth, for he saw that his daughter loved the man with a love that would be stayed by no obstacle nor bound by no man-made law or social custom. Sing Lee's indictment of Von Horn had come as an added blow to Professor Maxon, but it had brought its own supporting evidence in the flood of recollections it had induced in the professor's mind. Now he recalled a hundred chance incidents and conversations with his assistant that pointed squarely towards the man's disloyalty and villainy. He wondered that he had been so blind as to not have suspected his lieutenant long before. Virginia had at last succeeded in adjusting her rude bandage and stopping the flow of blood. Bulan had risen weakly to his feet. The girl, supporting, the girl supported him upon one side and singly upon the other. Professor Maxon approached the little group. I do not know what to make of all that singly has told us, he said. If you are not number thirteen, who are you? Where did you come from? It seems very strange, indeed, impossible, in fact. However, if you will explain who you are, I shall be glad to uh, consider uh, permitting you to pay court to my daughter. <laughs> I do not know who I am, replied Bulan. I had always thought that I was only number thirteen, until Sing Lee just spoke. Now I have a faint recollection of drifting for days upon the sea in an open boat. Beyond all, it is blank. I shall not force my attentions upon Virginia until I can prove my identity, and that my past is one which I can lay before her without shame. Until then, I shall not see her. You shall do nothing of the kind, 
cried the girl. You love me, and I love you. My father intended to force me to marry you while he still thought you were a soulless thing. Now that it is quite apparent you are a human being, and a gentleman, he hesitates, but I do not. As I have told you before, it makes no difference to me what you are. You have told me that you love me. You have demonstrated a love that is high and noble and self-sacrificing. More than that, no girl needs to know. I am satisfied to be the wife of Bulan. If Bulan is satisfied to have the daughter of the man who has so cruelly wronged him. An arm went around the girl's shoulders and drew her close to the man she had glorified with her loyalty and her love. The other hand was stretched out toward Professor Maxon. Professor, said Bulan, in the face of what Zing Li has told us, in the face of a disinterested comparison between myself and the miserable creatures of your experiments, is it not folly to suppose that I am one of them? Some day I shall recall my past. Until that time shall prove my worthiness, I shall not ask for Virginia's hand, and in this decision she must concur, for the truth might reveal some insurmountable obstacle to our marriage. In the meantime, let us be friends, Professor, for we are both actuated by the same desire, the welfare and happiness of your daughter. The old man stepped forward and took Bulan's hand. The expression of doubt and worry had left his face. "'I cannot believe it,' he said, "'that you are other than a gentleman. "'And if in my desire to protect Virginia "'I have said ought to wound you, "'I ask your forgiveness.' Bulan responded only with a tighter pressure of the hand. "'And now,' said the professor, "'let us return to the longhouse. "'I wish to have a few words in private with you, Von Horn.' and he turned to face his assistant. But the man had disappeared. Uh, "'Where is Dr. Von Horn?' exclaimed the scientist, addressing Sing Lee. "'Von Horn, he skedaddled a long time ago,' replied Sing Lee. "'He heard all he wanted to hear.' Slowly the little party wound along the jungle trail, and in less than a mile— to Virginia's infinite surprise, came out upon the river and the longhouse that she and Bulan had searched for in vain. Oh, and to think, she cried, that all these awful days we've been almost within sound of your voices. What strange freak of fate sent you to us today? Uh, we had about given up hope, replied her father, uh, when Sing Lee suggested to me that we cut across the highlands that separate this valley from the one adjoining it upon the northeast, where we should strike other tribes, and from them glean some clue to your whereabouts, in case your abductors had attempted to carry you back to the sea by another route. Uh, this seemed likely, in view of the fact that we were assured by enemies of Muda Safir that you were not in his possession, and that the river we were bound for would lead us to your captors most quickly out of the domains of that rascally Malay. Now they're back to being rascally again. Those rascally Malays. You may imagine our surprise, Virginia, when after proceeding for but a mile we discovered you. No sooner had the party entered the veranda of the longhouse than Professor Maxon made inquiries for Von Horn, only to learn that he had departed upstream in a prahu with several warriors, whom he had engaged to accompany him on a hunting expedition, having explained that the white girl had been found and was being brought to the longhouse. The chief further explained that he had done his best to dissuade the white man from so rash an act, as he was going directly into the country of the tribe of the two men he had killed, and that there was little chance that he would ever come out alive. While they were still discussing Von Horn's act and wondering at his intentions, a native on the veranda cried out in astonishment, pointing down the river. As they looked in the direction he indicated, all saw a graceful white cutter gliding around a nearby turn. At the oars were white-clad American sailors, and in the stern, two officers in the uniform of the, <laughs> of, 
of the United States Navy. <laughs> Man, where does Edgar Rice Burroughs not go? Man. Okay. Okay, we'll get back to that in just a second. Good gracious. Okay. Wow. Oh, does this, uh, does this camera look any better, by the way? I think it might be. I think it might be. Alrighty. Oh, my goodness. Okay. This is this is one of the most entertaining Burroughs books that I've read. Even even though it's boy, it's 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 got some problematic stuff in it. No, I mean no, I guess a lot of the stuff does, but um, it's 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 just yeah, it's it's just all over the place. Can't get enough of it. Can't get enough of it. Uh, it, it does look better. All right. Okay, I might, might have to get like a second, uh, second one of these cameras. And yeah, I had I had to run next door to uh, to grab this one when my webcam died. It, it literally died like like twenty seconds after I uh, started the stream up. It was yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Okay. Okay. Do you think they're all going to live happily ever after, or do you think um, there's still room for disaster? I, 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 I don't know. Could be, could be. We'll see, we'll see. Okay. Chapter 17. 999 Priscilla. As the cutter touched the bank, the entire party from the long house, whites and natives, were gathered on the shore to meet it. At first, the officers held off as though fearing a hostile demonstration, but when they saw the whites among the throng, a command was given to pull in, and a moment later one of the officers stepped ashore. "'I am Lieutenant May,' he said, "'of the USS New Mexico, flagship of the Pacific Fleet. Have I the honor to address Professor Maxson?' <laughs> the scientist nodded. <laughs> I am delighted, he said. Uh, we, we have been to your island, Professor, continued the officer, and judging from the evidence of hasty departure and the corpses of several natives there, I feared that some harm had befallen you. We therefore cruised along the Bornean coast, making inquiries of the natives, until at last we found one who had a, heard a rumor of a party of whites being far in the interior, searching for a white girl who had been stolen from them by pirates. The farther up this river we have come, the greater our assurance that we were on the right trail, for scarcely a native we interrogated had but seen or heard of some of your party." Mixed with the truth, they told us, were strange tales of terrible monsters led by a gigantic white man. "'The imaginings of childish minds,' said the professor. "'However, why, my dear lieutenant, did you honor me by visiting my island?' "'Bulan's already married with kids. Oh, boy! Man! That, that would be, though, that would be uh, the, uh, quite the... Uh, yeah, a, a turn of fate. Uh, however, why, my dear lieutenant, did you honor me by visiting my island? The officer hesitated a moment before answering, his eyes running about over the assembly as though in search of someone. Uh, well, Professor Maxson, uh, to be quite frank, he said at length, we learned at uh, Singapore the personnel of your party, uh, which included a former naval officer whom we've been seeking for many years. We came to your island to arrest this man. I refer to Dr. Carl von Horn. When the lieutenant learned of the recent disappearance of the man he sought, he expressed his determination to push on at once in pursuit and as Professor Maxson feared again to remain unprotected in the heart of the Bornean wilderness, his entire party was taken aboard the cutter. A few miles up the river, they came upon one of the Dyaks who had accompanied Von Horn a few hours earlier. The warrior sat smoking beside a beached prahu. When interrogated, he explained that Von Horn and the balance of his crew had gone inland, leaving him to guard the boat. He said that he thought he could guide them to the spot where the white man might be found. 
Professor Maxon and Singh accompanied one of the officers and a dozen sailors in the wake of the Dayak guide. Virginia Rambulan remained in the cutter, as the latter was still too weak to attempt to hard march through the jungle. For an hour the party traversed the trail in the wake of von Horn and his savage companions. They had come almost to the spot when their, uh, their ears were assailed by the weird and blood-curdling yells of native warriors, and a moment later von Horn's escort dashed into view in full retreat. At the sight of the white men they halted in relief, pointing back in the direction they had come, and jabbering excitedly in their native tongue. Warily the party advanced again behind these new guides, but when they reached the spot they sought, the cause of the Dayak's panic had fled, warned doubtless by their trained ears of the approach of an enemy. The sight that met the eyes of the searchers told all of the story that they needed to know. A hole had been excavated in the ground, partially uncovering a heavy chest, and across this chest lay the headless body of Dr. Karl von Horn. Lieutenant May turned toward Professor Maxon with a questioning look. It is he, said the scientist. Hmm. But the chest, inquired the officer. Maxon's treasure, spoke up singly. Von Horn has been trying to steal it for a long time. Treasure? exclaimed the professor. Boodoodreen gave up his life for this. Raja Muda Sophia fought and intrigued and murdered for possession of it. Poor misguided von Horn has died for it and left his head to wither beneath the rafters of a Dayak longhouse. It's incredible. But pr Professor Maxon, said Lieutenant May, man will suffer all these things and more for gold. Gold? cried the professor. Why, man, that is a box of books on biology and eugenics. There we go. I called it. I called it. My God, exclaimed May, and Von Horn was accredited to be one of the shrewdest swindlers and adventurers in America. But come, we may as well return to the cutter. My men will carry the chest. Uh, no, exclaimed uh, Professor Maxon with a vehemence with the vehemence the other could not understand. Uh, let them bury it again where it lies. It and what it contains have been the cause of sufficient misery and suffering and crime. Let it lie where it is, in the heart of savage Borneo, and pray to God that no man ever finds it, and that I shall, never for and that I shall forget forever that which is in it. On the morning of the third day, following the death of Von Horn, the New Mexico steamed away from the coast of Borneo. Upon her deck, looking back toward the verdure-clad hills, stood Virginia and Bulan. Oh, thank heaven, exclaimed the girl fervently, that we are leaving it behind us forever. Amen, replied Bulan, but yet, had it not been for Borneo, I might never have found you. We should have met somewhere else then, Bulan, said the girl in a low voice, for we were made for one another. No power on earth could have kept us apart. In your true guise you would have found me. I'm sure of it. It is maddening, Virginia, said the man, to be constantly straining every resource of my memory, and futile endeavor to catch and hold one fleeting clue to my past. Why, dear, do you realize that I may have been a fugitive from justice, as was von Horn, a vile criminal, perhaps? It is awful, Virginia, to contemplate the horrible possibilities of my lost past. What's up there, world's worst boy? How you doing? Yeah, that was a good time last night, getting a few rounds of drawful. That was fun. So much Shrek, so much Shrek going on. No, Bulan, you could never have been a criminal, replied the loyal girl. But there is one possibility that has been haunting me constantly. It frightens me just to think of it. It is... And the girl lowered her voice as though she feared to say the thing she dreaded most. It is that you may have loved another, that 
that you may even be married. There we go. B.W. called it. B.W. called that uh, shot right there. Bolan was about to laugh away any such fears when the gravity and importance of the possibility impressed him quite as fully as it had Virginia. He saw that it was not at all unlikely that he was already a married man, and he saw, too, what the girl now acknowledged, that they might never wed until the mystery of his past had cleared away. Uh, well, well, thank you there, World's Worst Boy. Yeah, we, we do this uh, here on, um, you, on YouTube uh, Monday through Thursday. Yeah, th 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 thank you for the, uh, yeah, thanks for the follow here on, uh, on YouTube. There is something that gives weight to my fear, continued Virginia, something that I had almost forgotten in the rush and excitement of events during the past few days. During your delirium, your ravings were, for the most part, quite incoherent. But there was one name that you repeated many times, a woman's name preceded by a number. It was 999 Priscilla. Maybe she... But Virginia got no further. With a low exclamation of delight, Bulan caught her in, her in his arms. "'It is all right, dear,' he cried. "'It is all right. Everything has come back to me now.' <laughs> That's such a <laughs> "'Everything has come back to me now. You have given me the clue. 999 Priscilla is my father's address.' <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we, we can do this, we can do this. 999 Priscilla is my father's address. 999 Priscilla Avenue. I am Townsend J. Harper, Jr. You have heard of my father. Everyone has since he commenced consolidating interurban traction companies. And I am not married, Virginia, and never have been. But I shall be, if this miserable old mud scow ever reaches Singapore. Oh, Bulan, cried the girl, how in the world did you ever happen to come to that terrible island of ours? <laughs> how did you ever happen to come to that terrible island of ours? I came for you, dear, he replied. It is a long story. After dinner, I will tell you all of it that I can recall. For the present, it must suffice you to know that I followed you from the railway station at Ithaca, half around the world, for a love that had been born from a single glance at your sweet face as you passed me to enter your pullman. On my father's yacht, I reached your island after trailing you to Singapore. It was a long and tedious hunt, and we followed many blind leads. But at last we came off an island upon which natives had told us such a party as yours was living. Five of us put off in a boat to explore. That is the last thing I can recall. Singh says he found me alone in a rowboat. A dummy. Virginia sighed and crept closer to him. You may be the son of the great Townsend J. Harper. You have been the soulless number thirteen. But to me, you will always be Bulan, for it was Bulan whom I learned to love. Man. Okay, so that's the end. That is, that is the end of that one. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That was just so stupid. <laughs> that last chapter was so dumb. It was so dumb. Oh, my. All right. Man. I mean, I mean, it's, 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 it's just, it just stretches, just stretches the, uh, like like the borders of all belief. Good lord. Okay. Okay. So that was a, it. Was fun. It was a very fun novel. I got to give it that much. It was a very fun novel. But man, 
I, I think by this time, Mr. Burroughs is, 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 he's jumping that shark and a half. Man, something that bag that money. Now, we just finished the novel, and it just had oh, the, the most, like, the, the unbelievable, un- just like, uh, no, no, uh, kind of uh, resolution to everything. Everything got like, wrapped up just so, yeah, just, uh, it just explained away. And but yeah, and I, and I keep going on about it there. But um, I mean, yeah, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs has got you know he's he's got his style there, and it's you know it's fun and it's entertaining. But but there's no there's no thought put into his his like world building really. Everything just rushes straight forward. No foreshadowing, no callbacks. It's uh yeah it's just just uh, push push, you know I I I I'm I'm convinced that he just writes, uh in in in, in a linear fashion, um, never never going back to like like re-edit or rework things which he's previously written in chapters to make things accommodate stuff more more or better later. Just 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 squirts it all out. Tap, 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 tap on the old typewriter, off to the editor, and uh, publish. Oh, but what do I know? I mean, the dude, uh, the dude made, uh, well, he's, I mean, obviously, he's a very, very successful writer. Um, yeah, I don't know, and he, he, he found his market and went with it. And, uh, yeah, all right. That was um that was uh that was entertaining. That, 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 okay, I, I, I'll give it that much. It was entertaining, but man, not the uh. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, just in case anyone was, uh, let me go get the page for this again. Let's see. This is um. How do I refresh that page? If anyone needs uh, more information about that book, here is the uh. Here's the link, uh, the, the wiki link for it there. And, you, you know, obviously, you know, being in the public domain, you can get a free uh, digital copy off of um, yeah, Gutenberg.org. Um, I, I think it was free in the uh, in the Amazon Kindle store. Got to be careful with that stuff, yeah. It would have been interesting commentary if he had turned out just being number 13. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um, there's, there's... But this whole thing, I mean... This whole thing with Sing Lee, that was that was just so weird too, because he knew everything that was going on. Uh, never never did anything with his knowledge. Did nothing. They didn't warn people, you know, when he knew terrible. And this big like revelation that um, yeah, he just he just happened to happened happened to find a dude in, in the thing, uh, in a boat in a cove, with amnesia, and substituted him for. Like, like pretended he was um, number thirteen. I I just couldn't stop laughing by that point. It was it was it was uh, it, it, it was it was quite silly. It was very silly the way it ended up. But that's okay. That's okay. I mean, uh, so okay. Um, well, we, we still got time. We still got another half hour and change to go. Yeah, we, we can uh, work in an, uh, an, another story. We, we can uh, get a short story in there. Um, man. Uh, let's see where we at. Let's just take a look. Let's take a look at our library here. What would be good? Could probably find. Oh, it re- there was a really good story in Grim Tales yesterday. That uh, Ebony Frame. I thought that was really good. That was really good. Let's see if we can find something interesting. And in, uh, there's probably there's like one and a half thousand short stories in here. I'm sure we can find something. Man. Oh, by the way, th- that's the other thing too. Um, uh, there we go. Something from Slavic uh, countries. Um, into the Zen Den, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, if anyone has any um, ideas for a book for uh, tomorrow, because um, we, uh, we'll will be starting a new novel tomorrow. I don't have one picked out yet. So if anyone's got any good suggestions, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll think about them. And maybe maybe we can get to it tomorrow, maybe a little later. We can make a little uh, list of things to get through. Um, that, that one would have been a good uh, precursor to uh, to Frankenstein, but we already read that. 
this one here, like segueing from the Monster Men into uh, Fra Frankenstein, I think would have been uh, a good match. Man. That was a really good book, that one. Really good. Okay, well, so what does this guy got? The Abode of the Gods. Okay, well, so we're gonna, we can uh, do some um, short stories for about a half hour. Okay, so who's this gentleman called again? Okay, Chodzko. Okay, Alex Alexander Chodzko. 1804 to 1891, a Polish poet, a folklorist, a Slavist, and a Iran Iranologist. Uh, Chodzko worked as a Russian diplomat in Iran and also worked for the French ministry in Paris. In 1857, he was the chair of Slavic languages and literature at the Collège de France and served on this position until 1883. Features 17 tales from Slavic countries and territories. That could be, okay, the abode of the gods. Kind of sounds good. Have I read uh, Into, Into Thin Air? Um, no, that, 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 uh, I think you've asked about that before. That's the one about the, uh, the, the rock climber, right? Is that the one? Oh, no, 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 it's, no, it's not. Uh, into thin air. I'm sure, I'm sure someone's asked about that before. Oh, no, uh, okay, uh, the Mount Everest disaster. Yeah, the, 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 that's not in the public domain. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I think you've asked about that, 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 that before. Um, man. Oh, Alfred Hitchcock uh, did one into thin air. Who who else wrote one? Is, is it, uh, let's see. Uh, also known as the Vanishing Lady. Uh, do, 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 who's that written? Hmm, okay. Not sure who that's, uh, who, where that one came from. Sense and Sensibility. Yeah, we, we, we've just, uh, we've recently done, um, uh, the, 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 those, um, those era, uh, books there. Mm -mm. Uh, you are talking about the mountain climbers there, uh, Baghdad Money? Is, 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 is that the one you mean? It is, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's a great story. I'm sure it's a great story, but, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, everything we do has got to be in the public domain, so, uh, yeah. We, we try to behave. The Abode of the Gods. One. The Two Brothers. Once upon a time, there were two brothers. Actually, let me do a page count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 13, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 30. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yeah, we can do that. We'll go a little over time for that. That's fine. Yeah, it looks like they don't, uh, that doesn't turn out well. Uh, once upon a time, there were two brothers whose father had left them but a small fortune. The eldest grew very rich, but at the same time cruel and wicked, whereas there was nowhere a more honest or kinder man than the younger. But he remained poor and had many children, so that at times they could scarcely get bread to eat. At last, one day, there was not even this in the house, so he went to his rich brother and asked him for a loaf of bread. Waste of time. His rich brother only called him beggar and vagabond and slammed the door in his face. The poor fellow, after this brutal reception, did not know which way to turn. Hungry, scantily clad, shivering with cold, his legs could scarcely carry him. He had not the heart to go home with nothing for the children, so he went towards the mountain forest. But all he found there were some wild pears that had fallen to the ground. He had to content himself with eating these, though they set his teeth on edge. But what was he to do to warm himself, for the east wind with its chill blast pierced him through and through? Oh, where shall I go? he said. What will become of us in the cottage? There is neither food nor fire, and my brother has driven me from his door. It was just then he remembered having heard that the top of the mountain in front of him was made of crystal and had a fire for ever burning upon it. 
I will try and find it, he said, and then I may be able to warm myself a little. So he went on climbing higher and higher till he reached the top, when he was startled to see twelve strange beings sitting round a huge fire. He stopped for a moment, but then said to himself, What have I to lose? Why should I fear? God is with me. Courage. So he advanced towards the fire, and bowing respectfully, said, Good people, take pity on my distress. I am very poor, and no one cares for me. I have not even a fire in my cottage. Will you let me warm myself at yours? They all looked kindly at him, and one of them said, My son, come sit down with us and warm yourself. So he sat down and felt warm directly he was near them. But he dared not speak while they were silent. What astonished him most was that they changed seats one after another, and in such a way that each one passed round the fire and came back to his own place. When he drew near the fire, an old man with a long white beard and bald head arose from the flames and spoke to him thus. Man, waste not thy life here. Return to thy cottage, work and live honestly. Take as many embers as thou wilt. We have more than we need. And having said this, he disappeared. Then the twelve filled a large sack with embers, and putting it on the poor man's shoulders, advised him to hasten home. Humbly thanking them, he set off. As he went, he wondered why the embers did not feel hot, and why they should weigh no more than a sack of paper. He was thankful that he should be able to have a fire, but imagine his astonishment when on arriving home he found the sack to contain as many gold pieces as there had been embers. He almost went out of his mind with joy at the possession of so much money. With all his heart he thanked those who had been so ready to help him in his need. He was now rich and rejoined to be able to provide for his family. Being curious to find out how many gold pieces there were, and not knowing how to count, he sent his wife to his rich brother for, a lo for the loan of a court measure. This time the brother was in a better temper, so he lent what was asked of him, but said mockingly, oh, "'What can beggars as you have to measure?' The wife replied, "'Our neighbor owes us some wheat.' We want to be sure he returns us the right quantity. The rich brother was puzzled, and suspecting something, he, unknown to his sister-in-law, put some grease inside the measure. The trick succeeded, for on getting it back he found a piece of gold sticking to it. Filled with astonishment, he could only suppose his brother had joined a band of robbers, so he hurried to his brother's cottage and threatened to bring him before the justice of the peace if he did not confess where the gold came from. The poor man was troubled, and dreading to offend his brother, told the story of his journey to the Crystal Mountain. And now the elder brother had plenty of money for himself— Yet he was envious of the brother's good fortune, and became greatly displeased when he found that his brother won everyone's esteem by the good use he made of his wealth. At last he determined to visit the Crystal Mountain himself. "'I may meet with as good luck as my brother,' said he to himself. Upon reaching the Crystal Mountain he found the twelve seated round the fire as before, and thus addressed them. I beg of you, good people, to let me warm myself, for it is bitterly cold, and I am poor and homeless. But one of them replied, My son, the hour of thy birth was favorable. Thou art rich, but a miser. Thou art wicked, for thou hast dared to lie to us. Well dost thou deserve thy punishment. Amazed and terrified, he stood silent, not daring to speak. Meanwhile, the twelve changed places, one after another, each at last returning to his own seat. Then from the midst of the flames arose the white-bearded old man, and spoke thus sternly to the rich man. 
Woe unto the willful! Thy brother is virtuous, therefore have I blessed. As for thee, thou art wicked, and so shalt not escape our vengeance. At these words the twelve arose. The first seized the unfortunate man, struck him, and passed him on to the second. The second also struck him, and passed him on to the third, and so did they all in their turn, until he was given up to the old man, who disappeared with him into the fire. Days, weeks, months went by, but the rich man never returned, and none knew what had become of him. I think between you and me the younger brother had his suspicions, but he very wisely kept them to himself. Hmm. Okay. Um, it looks like, uh, th th these, okay, so th th these are all in the same, um, same set of stories, so it looks like maybe there's like multiple stories. Um... Under the one uh, thing, let me let me take a quick look at that. Do, do, do. The, the abode of the yeah. So this is not the second story here. This is this is another chapter in the same thing. Okay, let's do it. Two. Time and the kings of the elements. And there was once a married pair who loved each other tenderly. The husband would not have given up his wife for all the riches in the world, while her first thought was how best to please him. So they were very happy, and lived like two grains in one ear of corn. Odd turn of phrase. One day, while working in the fields, a great longing came over him to see her, so without waiting for the hour of sunset, he ran home. Alas, she was not there. He looked high and low, he ran here and there and everywhere. He wept, he called to her, in vain. His dear wife was not to be found. So heartbroken was he that he no longer cared to live. He could think of nothing but the loss of his dear wife and how to find her again. At last he determined to travel all over the world in search of her. So he began to walk straight on, trusting God to direct his steps. Sad and thoughtful, he wandered for many days, until he reached a cottage close by the shores of a large lake. Here he stopped, hoping to find out news. On entering the cottage, he was met by a woman who tried to prevent him entering. "'What do you want here, unlucky wretch?' said she. "'If my husband sees you, he'll kill you instantly.' Uh, "'Who's your husband, then?' asked the traveller. "'What? You do not know him. My husband is the water king. Everything under water obeys him. Depart quickly, for if he finds you here, he will certainly devour you.' Hmm. "'Perhaps, after all, he would take pity on me. Uh, but hide me somewhere, for I am worn and weary and without shelter for the night.' So the water queen was persuaded and hid him behind the stove. Almost immediately after the water king entered, he had barely crossed the threshold when he called out, Wife, I smell human flesh. Give it to me quickly, for I am hungry. She dared not disobey him, and so she had to tell him of the traveler's hiding place. The poor man became terribly frightened, and trembled in every limb, and began to stammer out excuses. Oh, I assure you I've done no harm. I came here in search of news of my poor wife. Oh, do help me find her. I cannot live without her. Well, replied the water king, as you love your wife so tenderly, I will forgive you for coming here. But I cannot help you find her, for I do not know where she is. Yet I remember seeing two ducks on the lake yesterday. Perchance she is one of them. But I should advise you to ask my brother, the Fire King. He may be able to tell you more. Why would his wife now suddenly be a duck? Who knows? I don't know. We'll find out. 
Happy to have escaped so easily, he thanked the Water King and set out to find the Fire King. But the latter was unable to help him and could only advise him to consult his other brother, the Air King. But the Air King, though he had travelled all over the earth, could only say he thought he had seen a woman at the foot of the Crystal Mountain. Ah! But the traveller was cheered by the news, and <clears throat> went to seek his wife at the foot of the Crystal Mountain, which was close to their cottage. On reaching it, he began at once to climb the mountain, by making his way up the bed of the torrent that came rushing down there. Several ducks that were in the pool near the waterfall called out, "'Oh, my good man, don't go up there. You'll be killed!' But he walked fearlessly on till he came to some thatched cottages, at the largest of which he stopped. Here a crowd of wizards and witches surrounded him, screaming at the top of their voices, "'What are you looking for?' "'My wife,' said he, she is here, but you cannot take her away unless you recognize her among two hundred women all exactly like her. Uh, what? I not know my own wife? Why, here she is, said he, as he clasped her in his arms. And she, delighted to be with him again, kissed him fondly. Then she whispered, uh, Dearest... Though you knew me today, I doubt you will tomorrow, for there will be so many of us alike. Now I will tell you what to do. At nightfall, go to the top of the Crystal Mountain, where live the King of Time and his court. Ask him how you may know me. If you are good and honest, he will help you. If not, he will devour you whole at one mouthful. Man, these are some very capricious gods. I will do uh, I will do what you advise, dear one, he replied. But tell me, why did you leave me so suddenly? If you only knew what I have suffered, I have sought you all over the world. I did not leave you willingly, said she. A countryman asked me to come and look at the mountain torrent. When we got there, he sprinkled some water over himself, and at once I saw wings growing out of his shoulders, and he soon changed his shape entirely into that of a drake and I, too, became a duck at the same time, and whether I would or no, I was obliged to follow him. Here I was allowed to resume my own form, but now there is but the one difficulty of being recognized by you. <clears throat> this is some trippy stuff. So they parted, she to join the other women, he to continue his way to the Crystal Mountain. At the top he found twelve strange beings sitting round a large fire. They, they, they were the attendants of the king of time. He saluted them respectfully. "'What dost thou want?' they said. "'Oh, I've lost my dear wife. Can you tell me how to recognize her among two hundred other women, all exactly alike?' "'No,' said they. "'But perhaps our king can.' Then arose from the midst of the flames an old man with a bald head and long white beard, who, on hearing his request, replied, Though all these women be exactly alike, thy wife will have a black thread in the shoe of her right foot. So saying, he vanished, and the traveller, thanking the twelve, descended the mountain. Sure it is that without the black thread he would never have recognized her, and though the magician tried to hide her, the spell was broken and the two returned rejoicing to their home, where they lived happily ever after. These, 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 these are unusual ones. It reminds you of Jim Henson's The Storyteller. I'm not familiar with that. Don't know that one. They got some... I think, uh, I think all these... Um, yeah... Uh, yeah, I, th I think everyone's going to end up at the Crystal Mountain in all of these uh, short stories. I think there was um, one more in this series, was it? One? Uh, three. Yeah. One more in the set. This is probably another Crystal Mountain one. Interesting. Interesting the way that goes. The Twelve Months. There was once a widow who had two daughters... 
Helen, her own child by her dead husband, and Marukla, his daughter, by his first wife. She loved Helen, but hated the poor orphan, because she was far prettier than her own daughter. Marukla did not think about her good looks, but could not understand why her stepmother should be angry at the sight of her. The hardest work fell to her share. She cleaned out the rooms, cooked, washed, sewed, spun, wove, brought in the hay, milked the cow, and all this without any help. Helen, meanwhile, did nothing but dress herself in her best clothes and go to one amusement after another. But Marukla never complained. She bore the scoldings and bad temper of mother and sister with a smile on her lips and the patience of a lamb. But this angelic behavior did not soften them. They became even more tyrannical and grumpy, for Marukla grew daily more beautiful, while Helen's ugliness increased. So the stepmother determined to get rid of Marukla, for she knew that while she remained her own for she knew that while she remained, her own daughter would have no suitors. Hunger, every kind of privation, abuse, every means was used to make the girl's life miserable. The most wicked of men could not have been more mercilessly cruel than these two vixens. But in spite of it all, Marukla grew ever more sweeter and more charming. One day, in the middle of winter, Helen wanted some wood violets. Listen, cried she to Marukla, you must go up to the mountain and find me some violets. I want some to put in my gown. They must be fresh and sweet-scented. Do you hear? Oh, but my dear sister, who ever heard of violets blooming in the snow? said the poor orphan. You wretched creature, do you dare to disobey me? said Helen. Not another word. Off with you. If you do not bring me some violets from the mountain forest, I will kill you. The stepmother also added her threats to those of Helen, and with vigorous blows they pushed Marukla outside and shut the door upon her. The weeping girl made her way to the mountain. The snow lay deep, and there was no trace of any human being. Hey, B.W.'s out of here again. Have a great day. Have a great day. And enjoy the rest of the week. The rest of the week is going to be great. It's going to be great. Uh, the weeping girl made her way to the mountain. The snow lay deep, and there was no trace of any human being. Long she wandered hither and thither and lost herself in the wood. She was hungry and shivered with cold and prayed to die. Suddenly she saw a light in the distance and climbed towards it till she reached the top of the mountain. Upon the highest peak burnt a large fire, surrounded by twelve blocks of stone, on which sat twelve strange beings. Of these, the first three had white hair, three were not quite so old, three were young and handsome, and the rest still younger. There they all sate silently, looking at the fire. They were the twelve months of the year. The great Setchen, January, was placed higher than the others, his hair and moustache were white as snow, and in his hand he held a wand. At first Marukla was afraid, but after a while her courage returned, and drawing near she said, A men of God, may I warm myself at your fire? I am chilled by the winter cold. The great Setchain raised his head and answered, What brings thee here, my daughter? What dost thou seek? Oh, I am looking for violets, replied the maiden. This is not the season for violets. Dost thou not see the snow everywhere? said Set Jane. I know well, but my sister and my stepmother have ordered me to bring them violets from your mountain. If I return without them, they will kill me. I pray you, good shepherds, tell me where they may be found. Here the great Set Jane arose and went over to the youngest of the months, and, placing his wand in his hand, said, Brother Brezane, march, do thou take the highest place. Yeah, Uncle Cargai, what's up? Hey, yeah, good to see you. Brezane obeyed, at the same time waving his wand over the fire. 
Immediately, the flames rose towards the sky, the snow began to melt, and the trees and shrubs to bud. The grass became green, and from between its blades peeped the pale primrose. It was spring, and the meadows were blue with violets. "'Gather them quickly, Marukla,' said Bre Breze. Joyfully, she hastened to pick the flowers, and having soon a large bunch, she thanked them and ran home. Helen and the stepmother were amazed at the sight of the flowers, the scent of which filled the house. Uh, "'Where did you find them?' asked Helen. "'Under the trees on the mountain slope,' said Marukla. Helen kept the flowers for herself and her mother. She did not even thank her stepsister for the trouble she had taken. The next day she desired Marukla to fetch her strawberries. I, I figured as much there, Uncle Kargai. I figured as much. Yeah, hope your day is going well. Run, said she, and fetch me strawberries from the mountain. They must be very sweet and ripe. But who ever heard of strawberries ripening in the snow? exclaimed Marukla. Hold your tongue, worm. Don't answer me. If I don't have my strawberries, I'll kill you. Then the stepmother pushed her into the yard and bolted the door. The unhappy girl made her way towards the mountain and to the large fire round which sat the twelve months. The great set chain occupied the highest place. Men of God, may I warm myself at your fire. The winter cold chills me said she, drawing near. The great set chain raised his head and asked, Why comest thou here? What dost thou seek? I'm looking for strawberries, said she. We are in the midst of winter, replied set chain. Strawberries do not grow in the snow. I know said the girl sadly, but my sister and stepmother have ordered me to bring them strawberries. If they don't, they will kill me. If I don't, they will kill me. Pray, good shepherds, tell me where to find them. The great Zetjane arose, crossed over to the month opposite him, and putting the wand into his hand, said, Brother Chervain, June, do thou take the highest place? Jervain obeyed, and as he waved his wand over the fire, the flames leapt towards the sky. Instantly the snow melted, the earth was covered with verdure, trees were clothed with leaves, birds began to sing, and various flowers blossomed in the forest. <clears throat> it was summer. Under the bushes masses of star-shaped flowers changed into ripening strawberries. Before Marukla had time to cross herself, they covered the glade, making it look like a sea of blood. "'Gather them quickly, Marukla,' said Chervain. Joyfully she thanked the months, and, having filled her apron, ran happily home. Helen and her mother wondered at seeing the strawberries, which filled the house with their delicious fragrance. "'Wherever did you find them?' asked Helen crossly. Right up among the mountains? Those from under the beech trees are not bad. Helen gave a few to her mother and ate the rest herself. Not one did she offer to her stepsister. Being tired of strawberries, on the third day she took a fancy for some fresh red apples. Run, Marukla, said she, and fetch me fresh red apples from the mountain. Apples in winter, sister, why the trees have neither leaves nor fruit. Idle slut, go this minute, said Helen. Unless you bring back apples, we will kill you. As before, the stepmother seized her roughly and turned her out of the house. The poor girl went weeping up the mountain, across the deep snow, upon which lay no human footprint, and on towards the fire round which were the twelve months. Motionless sat they, and on the highest stone was the great set chain. Men of God, may I warm myself at your fire. The winter cold chills me, said she, drawing near. The great set chain raised his head. 
Why comest thou here? What dost thou seek? asked he. I am come to look for red apples, replied Maruka. Catch you later there, bag that money? Yeah, good to see you again. Have a great day, and, th and thanks for uh, spending some time with us. I am come to look for red apples, replied Marukla. But this is winter, and not the season for red apples. I know, answered the girl, but my sister and my stepmother sent me to fetch red apples from the mountain. If I return without them, they will kill me. Thereupon the great Setjane arose and went over to one of the elderly months, to whom he handed the wand, saying, Brother Zare, September, do thou take the highest place? Zare moved to the higher stone and waved his wand over the fire. There was a flare of red flames. The snow disappeared, but the fading leaves which trembled on the trees were sent by a cold northeast wind in yellow masses to the glade. Only a few flowers of autumn were visible, such as the fleabane and red gillyflower, autumn colic colchicums in the ravine, and under the beeches, bracken, and tufts of northern heather. At first Marukla looked in vain for red apples, and then she espied a tree which grew at a great height, and from the branches of this hung the bright red fruit. Zare ordered her to gather some quickly. The girl was delighted and shook the tree. First one apple fell, then another. That is enough, said Zare. Hurry home. Thanking the months, she returned joyfully. Helen marveled, and the stepmother wondered at seeing the fruit. Where did you gather them? asked the stepsister. There are more on the mountain top, answered Marukla. Then why did you not bring more? said Helen angrily. You must have eaten them on the way back, you wicked girl. Uh, no, dear sister, I have not even tasted them, said Marukla. I shook the tree twice. One apple fell each time. I was not allowed to shake it again, but was told to return home. May Perim smite you with his thunderbolt, said Helen, striking her. Marukla prayed to die rather than suffer such ill treatment. Weeping bitterly, she took refuge in the kitchen. Helen and her mother found the apples more delicious than they had ever tasted, and when they had eaten both, longed for more. "'Listen, mother,' said Helen. "'Give me my cloak. I will fetch some more apples myself, or else that good-for-nothing wretch will eat them all on the way. I shall be able to find the mountain and the tree. The shepherds may cry, Stop, but I shall not go till I have shaken down all the apples.' In spite of her mother's advice, she put on her pelisse, covered her head with a warm hood, and took the road to the mountain. The mother stood and watched her till she was lost in the distance. Snow covered everything. Not a human footprint was to be seen on its surface. Helen lost herself and wandered hither and thither. After a while she saw a light above her, and, following in its direction, reached the mountain top. There was the flaming flyer, the twelve blocks of stone, and the twelve months. At first she was frightened and hesitated. Then she came nearer and warmed her hands. She did not ask permission, nor did she speak one polite word. What hast brought thee here? What dost thou seek? Oh, I'm not obliged to tell you, old greybeard. What business is it of yours? She replied disdainfully, turning her back on the fire and going towards the forest. The great Setchain frowned and waved his wand over his head. Instantly the sky became covered with clouds. The fire went down. Snow fell in large flakes. An icy wind howled round the mountain. Amid the fury of the storm, Helen added curses against her stepsister. The police failed to warm her benumbed limbs. The mother kept on waiting for her. She looked from the window, she watched from the doorstep, but her daughter came not. The hours passed slowly, 
but Helen did not return. Can it be that apples have charmed her from her home? thought the mother. Then she clad herself in hood and police and went in search of her daughter. Snow fell in huge masses. It covered all things. It lay untouched by human footsteps. For long she wandered hither and thither. The icy northeast wind whistled in the mountain, but no voice answered her cries. Day after day Marukla worked and prayed and waited, but neither stepmother nor sister returned. They had been frozen to death on the mountain. The inheritance of a small house, a field, and a cow fell to Marukla. In course of time, an honest farmer came to share them with her, and their lives were happy and peaceful. Yeah, these these old-timey uh, fairy tales there. The old-timey fairy tales where everyone gets their grisly just desserts. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And the, and, the, and the two people who were mean, they froze to death in the snow. <laughs> yeah. That was pretty good. I think that was pretty good. It's, um, it, it was a little different to what I thought it was going to be, though. But that is it, though. It is noon. It is noon. I think I need to be, uh, need to be uh, packing up and getting going. Man. Boy, oh boy. Well, you're, you're very welcome there, Melissa. Very welcome. 